committee tries to provide topics related to music, spirituality, current events, history, whatever, but we need your ideas. So please don't hesitate to suggest and keep your eye out for people who are good speakers and who would be interesting and inspiring to all of us. So here is Paul Anderson talking to us about the state capitol. Wonderful husband, I, don't go away, I'm going to need your help. You know, it's very hard going through life as Jan's arm candy. Uh, you continually get marginalized and downgraded, and, uh, but, you know, you, you could have done better with that introduction. Anyway, uh, I, Oh, what did I do with my notes? I lost, forgot them. There they are. Anyway, I wonder at age 80 plus why I keep doing these things. But then I started wondering why I'm here. And I figured, oh, it's the first Sunday after the New Year's. There's not going to be many people here. So that's why Jan decided to have me because she knew I would come back to church Anyway, even though there's, but there are more people here than I thought. Uh, but actually, one of the reasons it's uh, topical is because uh, there's much discussion now going on about uh, Minnesota icons. You know, there's the state seal, there's the state flag, and there's the discussion about the remodeling of uh, the state office building. So uh, there's some discussion about. Whew, I don't know how to move this now. Ah, there we are. Uh, about the remodeling of the state office building. And I talked about the Capitol restoration probably about eight, nine years ago. And uh, Jan thought it might be good to revisit that restoration project and see whether it worked and how well it worked. And what are some of the things that uh, came about because of it? Now. I am unapologetically a, I wouldn't say a jingoist, but at least a chauvinist when it comes to the state of Minnesota. I love our state. There are so many good things about it. And uh, one of the good things about it is, is we have one of the three or four absolutely best state capitals in the country. Now, it's not the biggest. It's not the most common. It is pound for pound in its design. Uh, viewed as one of the best. And it's designed by a Minnesotan, uh, Cass Gilbert. That's where Cass Gilbert got his start, really his national reputation. And he went up, and some of you don't realize that he was the architect for the Supreme Court building in uh, Washington, D.C. So a distinguished career. He put his whole heart into this building. He wanted it to be special, and throughout his life, he saw it as uh, being special. It's our third state capital. The first one started as territorial capital, was expanded and burned down. I think that it was because of the heated discussion over, <laughs> over whether to repay the railroad bonds that were issued in 1857, and uh, so many people took advantage of them and scammed the state that. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more on uh, Pillsbury, that the discussion was so heated there was spontaneous combustion in the chamber and it burned down. They built a second capital and it was too small, but more importantly, it was hazardous to one's health. The fumes from the coal, uh, coal boiler permeated the building so that it was basically uninhabitable. And so, that, but that was a good thing for Minnesota because they decided to build a third capital. And it was in the 19, or 1880s, yeah, 1883 they started talking about it, in 1896 they started it. But it was a time when Minnesota was trying to uh, put itself forward and the idea that we belonged in the United States as a state and we were going to show it through our uh, state capital, and we did. 
Yet, uh, when it was opened, it was widely regarded as one of the most iconic and best capitals in the country. Things that made it, it was, if you go to that capital, you will see it personify the type of government we have in the United States. Because you have the executive there, you have the legislative, and you have the judicial. And so, it's a civics lesson. And Actually, I'm going to have available to you afterwards. Cass Gilbert designed it as the People's Building, and he knew we were a nation of immigrants. So throughout the building, I underestimated the crowd today, but I've got some copies of the sayings that he placed around the building, and Jan will distribute them later. But they are statements from our founders and our iconic leaders that say, what our democracy is about. So this building is truly a wonderful symbol of our democracy. Uh, Cass Gilbert spent six months in Europe studying marvelous buildings over there. He climbed to the top of St. Peter's, and that's where he got the idea for the dome at our capital. People don't realize that the dome at our capital is the third largest unsupported marble dome in the world. St. Peter's is first. Oh, no, I misspoke. It is the second largest dome. St. Peter's is the first, uh, our capital is the second, and the Taj Mahal is the third. So when you look up at that dome, you're looking at truly a internationally significant uh, uh, building. The building costs 2.5, well, it was bid at 2.5 million. There were cost overruns. It actually cost 4.5 billion. That's a pretty big margin of error. Uh, but Gilbert wanted to do it right, and so he had gone to the Chicago Exposition in 19, or 1896, the, the White City. Uh, Chicago's World Fair, and he was very impressed. And he came back from there with many ideas. That's where we get the idea of the quadriga. And he wanted it white. But we don't have white stone in Minnesota. The best white stone is the white marble from Georgia. Uh-oh. Georgia was a Confederate state. This building was built as a memorial to the uh, uh, veterans of the Civil War who fought on the Union side for Minnesota. People don't realize that Minnesota was the first state to volunteer troops for the uh, Civil War. Governor Ramsey happened to be in Washington, D.C. when Fort uh, Sumter was attacked. So he went around down to uh, Lincoln and volunteered Minnesota troops. I was giving this speech to a group that included some people from Massachusetts, and they went after me. He said, sir, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. It was Massachusetts that volunteered the first truth. I said, no, sir, you're wrong. <laughs> he said, we didn't have the troops. Ramsey didn't have a regiment to volunteer, but he volunteered it anyway. <laughs> and so Massachusetts was second to Minnesota when it came. And so now, you're going to put Georgian marble? There it is. You can take a look at it. In the state capitol? Ah. Well, if you look at the capitol, you'll see that the base is Minnesota granite. But on top of that Minnesota granite base is the white marble, which makes it the wonderful building uh, uh, that it is. And we brought in stonemasons from all over the country. Many of the best were in Georgia. The father, no, the grandfather of Marvin Anderson, an esteemed former state law librarian, came to Minnesota because he was a stonemason who worked on that uh, building. So there were some many, many artisans who came here and participated in it. I could go on for two or three hours. I just love that building and tell you all the nuances, and, but I gotta restrain myself. And so, why did we need to remodel, restore it, and what were the impacts? One, the exterior marble, which is nice, was falling off. 
literally falling off. It was uh, 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 a safety hazard. My good friend, and in the inside was falling down too. My good friend, Representative Dean Erdahl, has a classic thing, you can get it on YouTube, where he was at the House of Representatives and brought in a piece of plaster that was falling down. He said, now, you know, if you want to walk in this building and run the risk of being hit by falling plaster, don't vote for this restoration bill. And it took a long time to get it passed. There are some troglodytes, that's, that's what they are, who serve in the legislature, and they were not going to, okay. Now I'll talk about, well, I'll talk about Valenti now. Valenti lacked the vision to see what was needed on that building. When the carpet was deteriorating in the governor's reception room, he suggested that one of his staff members seek out Rudy Boschowitz at Plywood, Minnesota, and uh, get some carpeting from uh, uh, Plywood, Minnesota. Fortunately, that uh, didn't happen. But the current restoration project came together in about 2011, 2012. Governor Dayton got behind it, and some key people from both sides of the aisle in the legislature said we need to do it. And so, and another key thing was they had to get the state senators out of the Capitol. They didn't want to leave. And Ann Rest, who was on the, uh, the uh, committee for the state office building, said, you know, Paul, you're going to have to drag me kicking and screaming out of the state Capitol. So she only wanted uh, uh, for uh, there to be 47 offices in the new state office building instead of 67 for all the state senators. That was a big fight, actually. I remember going before the legislature and said, you know, remember the, the movie Field of Dreams? They said, I have a message for you. You build it with 67 and they will come. <laughs> and they did, they did. And so, uh, but what that move meant is we got more public space uh, in, in the Capitol. The fine art was deteriorating. That needed to be restored. The stencil work on the plaster was deteriorating. Fauna. That had to need to be restored. Oh, and they uncovered and restored any number of skylights. You know, the trendy thing was to put in false ceilings and uh, fluorescent lighting and cover up the skylights. You go back to the Capitol now, you see all these uh, skylights that are restored. The quadriga needed to be uh, uh, repaired and regilded. You know, you can, t the gold on the, it's gold is heavy, but, but less than the size of a soccer ball. That's the amount of gold on the quadriga at the Capitol. It's so thin and so fine but it had to be redone. And uh, uh, the rat skeller was, oh, oh yes, I'm sensitive here because some of you have German heritage. Jan is reading, oh yeah, my wife is reading, she's reading the book, uh, Minnesota Midnight, which talks about the attitude of the people of the United States in the late 19-teens and the early 1920s. Germans were not well liked. The road to our house used to be called German Road, renamed Babcock Trail. Jan's family's priest advised that they drop the second R on her family last name, Stater. Drop the R, you're too identified as German. And of course, you had this German rascaler, so that would not work. So they completely kind of, I wouldn't say destroyed, I would say mutilated. Uh, uh, the German signs in the Ratzkiller. And uh, the other thing, and I'll be talking about it, is that with getting the senators out, we got new gathering spaces, and I'm going to talk about some of those. We have a classroom for students, and we have a new entrance for students on the uh, east side, so a bus can pull up. Oh, and if somebody's in a wheelchair, they can go right in. Yeah, it's, it's ADA, uh, compliant. Ah, for the women in the crowd, better restrooms. <laughs> you know, it was designed in 1896, and we everybody knew that at that time a woman's place was in the home, so 
there were no need for women's restrooms in the state capitol. I think there was one. So we did a lot of good things. Now, in the time I have available, what I've done is to prepare a PowerPoint that will highlight some of the things that were done. I think the first, uh, now that shows, oh, okay. That shows the cathedral in the background. I'll talk about the fun part later. See, Archbishop John Ireland was a very popular and powerful figure in the uh, 1890s. He had been with the troops at the Civil War, was now Archbishop. And he knew they were gonna build a new state capital. But he also knew that Minneapolis was the center of economic uh, power and a lot of political power. So he figured, aha, they build a third state capital. They're gonna have to build it in St. Paul, but as close to Minneapolis as they can get. The best place to do that is uh, over where town and country and St. Thomas is now located. So being the kind of the plunger and entrepreneur that Ireland was, he bought a lot of land over there. Well, they didn't go there. They went up on the hill in, in St. Paul. So he was going to lose a lot of money. Well, uh, James J. Hill's wife, Mary, was Catholic. James J. Hill was uh, Scotsman, uh, you know, like us, Presbyterian and John Knox and all that uh, uh, whole predestination. I won't get in there. But anyway, he was not Catholic, but Mary was. And she had a lot of influence uh, on her husband, and Ireland convinced her to fund a dome for a new cathedral. Now, if you look, it was at the site of the old Kitson mansion. He went broke, and they were going to tear it down. If you look at the cathedral, it is basically a base for a large dome. And the dome is higher than the dome on the state capitol. It was a little bit like, oh, excuse my terminology, uh, John Ireland giving his middle finger to this secular building down the street that had this wonderful dome. He says, you build that dome, I can build one that's bigger. And so that's what happened with the cathedral. It is basically a base for the large dome that Ireland wanted. Now, in the front part of this picture is now I'm going to transition to some of the things that a comment about the restoration. What I'm showing there is the front area of the cap. That used to be a street. And if you can remember, there used to be uh, parking meters there. But when the legislature was in session, they were covered, reserved for state senators. Oh, the senators didn't want to give up their parking. That, close. that, that was a fight. Uh, but now there's not traffic. It can be open to traffic, but that has turned out to be a gathering space on the uh, front of the steps of the capitol that people use. Here is Cass Gilbert. He was the uh, architect, and as I said, he, the, he, uh, he, he designed the Woolworth Building, which at the time was the tallest building in the world. And uh, here's the dome, and I'm going to go. There's the crystal ball. That can be lowered and clean. It's not lowered. It's only lit on the 11th of May, which is statehood day. But it gets dirty. And so here you see it being uh, brought down during the restoration. And they're cleaning all those prisms uh, on the, uh, on the uh, chandelier. This is the art. This is in the rotunda. There are, okay, I'll get to this a little bit later. There aren't too many women portrayed in the Capitol. And a lot of them aren't fully clothed. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's mythical Greek Roman art. And this is, there's a series of uh, five pieces of art, or four pieces, that show the uh, trail of the immigrant coming to uh, America, leaving the homeland, uh, enduring the hardship, the tigers, and uh, coming and tilling the land, and then the last one being uh, very comfortable and successful. So it tells the immigrant uh, story. 
This is the spiral tear case. This is another thing that happened with the renovation. Before renovation, this was the only stairway that would go from the bottom of the capital to the top. Otherwise, there were not stairway accesses. What they did with the restoration, they had to take out some of the uh, historic pieces, but they installed new stairways so you could walk in other places from the, uh, the basement to the top. I, always, I, I like to tell people that they have to walk down this stairway single file because it's no internal support, and if you put too much weight on it, it's going to collapse. Uh, but this is one of the wonderful architectural features of this building. There are not many staircases like this. There's one in the Supreme Court courthouse, but you, when you go to the Capitol, you've got to experience this staircase because it's truly one of the iconic things. Ah, I look back. Restrooms. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have to tell you what we did. We we really did a good job of making new restrooms, so that you know, if you're a woman in the capital now, you just look for the sign, and there's uh, uh, two uh, things to depict, so you can find a place uh, to go. This is a space that I particularly like. This is the basement, and uh, before restoration, it was. Uh, hallways, it was unused space. You had piping and electrical conduit all over the place. It was a unfriendly place. It was a means by which you got from one place to the other. The Capitol's complex tunnel went through there. And I had a role to play with. I was in Texas and I visited the Texas State Capitol. I went to their basement and they had a room like this that they used as a gathering space. It was a place where people could go. They didn't have to be in the rotunda, the center activity. They could gather and, uh, and get together before they went up to lobby or whatever. Now this space is used almost every day during the legislative session, sometimes twice a day. And you can set up chairs. I think it's one of the few places that you can drink red wine in the capital. Otherwise, you can't have red wine because red wine stains marble. And so you can have, after 4 o'clock, you can have beer and white wine, but you can't have uh, uh, white wine. Here's some more pictures of the space. It's, uh, it, it, it really is quite usable. Ah, this is the old Supreme Court conference dining room. Before restoration, that was a dusty, dirty place where they stored unused building materials. It, it was just, it wasn't used at all. And so it's restored the way it was supposed to be for the Supreme Court. There was a time that there were nine members on the court. This room can be used by anybody. They can sign it up if they got a group meeting at the Capitol. It's it's wonderful. It feels very, very, very uh, sophisticated. And kind. there's another view. Oh, I, I didn't get a picture of the foundation, but uh, you could see originally the foundation blocks, and it had cleared the dirt out. But originally, the dirt in the Capitol went up about uh, three or four feet on the Capitol foundation blocks. And uh, they removed that and made this space. Now, when Cass Gilbert designed this building, he was pretty darn good. When they restored the building, they used labor, laser. He didn't have laser. He had levels and other things to get the building. But when he uh, did it, he did it so well that when they did the restoration, the elevation from one end of the Capitol varied by less than one inch. Think about that big building and being built there and having it so well built that uh, only less than an inch of variation. He was pretty darn good, actually. This is the restored brass sculler. It's not a very good uh, picture, but you have now the German artwork on the ceiling. 
well, the session is in progress. This building, this room is full of people coming down here. They're getting some lunch and they're talking business and whatever. It's generally not open uh, when the legislature is not in session. Okay, this gets me to back to Pillsbury. See, I'm not going to tell about everything about the restoration, just some of the things that, you know, kind of like. They wanted to take the governor's portraits out of the Capitol. They said, no, it's just colors, we're going to run out of the room. Well, I strongly objected to that, very strong, because they're my friends. They really are. I mean, some of them I actually knew, going back to Harold Stass and other I knew from history. And I would go to the Capitol and I'd visit them from time to time. And I would participate in uh, Minnesota history. Pillsbury is one I particularly like because he was the one that got the bonds paid off so that uh, we, <laughs> the Eastern financiers, would now uh, deal with Minnesota. But he was also governor during the time that you had the grasshopper plague in southwestern Minnesota. Two years straight, the grasshoppers came in from South Dakota. They swarmed over the southwestern part of the state and basically devoured all the crops. That was an area that was settled by a lot of Germans. This was in uh, 1870s. And Pillsbury knew that he was the governor of the whole state, so he went out to see what was going on. There's a, it's not an apocryphal story because it was, he was traveling, trying to visit with the people, and he saw this German farmer walking. He thought he was walking down. He didn't have a coat on in the dead of winter. And he wondered, my gosh, this guy must be freezing. Pillsbury took off his own coat and gave it to the farmer and said, here, you need this more than I do. That's the type of governor he was. And he came back to Minnesota, and, and they had no social networks back then, but in, implemented relief. And it was driven by the fact he visited with this German household, and uh, they didn't have much to eat, and he was talking to the father. You know, and of course, German, Lutheran, or Catholic, reading the Bible, I am the head of the household. It is my responsibility to take care of my family. I don't take. And so when uh, Pillsbury asked him, he said, is there anything I can do for you and your family? And he said, no, the Bible says I'm. And then Pillsbury looked at his daughter, who was skinny, spindly legs, and he said, I'm not talking about you, sir. I'm talking about your daughter. Is there something I can do for your daughter? And the guy broke down and cried, and that led to... Uh, Pillsbury providing some aid to this. That's why I like to visit him. Oh, there's another thing about Pillsbury I like. The third year was coming and everybody is worried the grasshoppers would come. And uh, this was back when, uh, kind of before Darwin, when he took the Bible literally and whatever and believed in the Bible, he said, you know, what we need to do is to have a statewide day of prayer for the people in southwest Minnesota. We need to pray that the grasshoppers will not come and that they'll have good crops. Well, lo and behold, there was an early frost, or a late frost, killed the grasshopper larvae. Those that did survive flew over southwestern Minnesota and turned around and flew back. It, literally, I now, you know, I have different attitudes towards prayer than some people do, but, you know, something worked there because that year they had a bumper crop and they were able to feed their family. But they wanted to take the picture out. So my argument was, no, what we have is just the picture and a name. We need to have something that describes who these people were and why they were governor and what they contributed to the state. So this is an example. I'm, I, you know, damn, darn. I'm going to injure my elbow here because you're going to find that sometimes I'm going to bend my elbow and pat, pat myself on the black, back occasionally with some of the things that happened uh, during it. Had Jan is waving. She said, if she were closer to me, she'd be kicking my shin right now. <laughs> <laughs> 
But one of the things we did was to put in these explanations. Now this is the picture of Rudy and Lola. This is kind of controversial. Uh, Rudy served two years, and then he lost, and he went to Vienna, and he came back. And his first portrait was a picture of a man standing and with the Iron Range pits in back of him. Now, Arnie Carlson always, uh, Arnie, uh, Rudy didn't like that picture. Arnie was always of the opinion because Rudy was in Vienna. Uh, Rudy's brother, George, stood in for him at that picture, and the picture looked more like George than it did at Rudy. So now Rudy had a second run at governor, and he wanted to have Lola in the picture. Well, you don't have your wife in the picture with you as the governor. Well, he said, Al Qui has his horses. Why can't I have, uh, I have Lola? And there was a big controversy. Uh, finally got, I went over for the dedication of this because uh, Lola and Rudy were very much a team. He really loved his wife and they worked well together and I thought that, you know, he should have, he had been, he had deceased by this time, but Lola should be with him. So, ironically, <laughs> when we were restoring the capital, Lola was only three women, of th one of three women depicted in the capital when he did the restoration. I mean, she was a definite minority, so I could make a point of it. Now, here's Tim Pawlenty. Uh He's in a kind of a remote corner of the capital. Uh, I know Tim, I knew him way back when he was working for Dernberg. Uh, he will not be remembered as one of our better governors. The last six years of his term, he lost his vision for the state of Minnesota and started focusing on national office. But he did some good things, especially during his first term with respect to water and the Great Lakes Accord. And they, somebody at the Historical Society did his play. This is the new one. The old one was absolutely horrible. All it did, the person who wrote it must not have liked him. But all it did was depict his defeats and failures. And uh, I went to Steve Elliott, who was head of the Historical Society at the time, and he said, this is a disgrace. Your office should not be behind something like this. Tim Pawlenty was elected governor of the state twice. He did some good things. He may not be one of our better governors, but he was governor. You've got to revise it. And now they have a revised uh, thing that is much more complimentary to Tim. Now on the third floor, uh, we have a display that depicts Native American history. Uh, the Native Americans were not very popular in the state in the 1890s and 1900s. Uh, they were viewed as savages and were rugged. But what happened is during restoration, the Mendewakan Sioux at uh, Prior Lake and the, the Smithsonian put together an exhibit on uh, why treaties matter and Native Americans. I suggested to the uh, Mr. Administration that they display that in the Capitol during the opening. He did better than that. He bought it and made it part of a permanent exhibit up on the third floor so you get to see it there. And this is part of what's happened on the third floor. This is a room, it's used as a caucus room for legislative, it used to be legislative offices. You have pictures of Islamic Americans. It's a very usable space for the legislature in session. This is a side uh, conference room that's also used. You can check them out and use it as public space. This is gallery space. This used to be offices for workers for the uh, uh, senators, and it's now a space where they have rotating works of art, and you can have receptions there. Only white wine, though, even though it's a wood floor. And uh, this is a space that I really like. It used to bother me that when lobbyists came to the Capitol, I would see them sitting around on the floor on their coats. There's no place for them to go. This is the lobbyists' lounge. There is a place for them to go. 
In the basement, we have lockers where they can put their coats and others. But this is a place where they can just go and relax as they're waiting to. And so it's a very well-used space. This is the Cass Gilbert Library. Uh, I was originally of the opinion to put doors on this room. I was overruled, rightly so, because it's open and you walk through the Capitol, you can go there. There's lounges, there's a, a chair. Now I'm going to talk about the art and the reception room. You know, I got to move on. And uh, when we were doing the restoration, uh, Governor Dayton said, I think we should take these Civil War paintings out of the governor's reception room. They depict violence, there's blood, and the, the most famous one is the Battle of Nashville, where American tro uh, Minnesota troops uh, charged across an open field of 400 yards and uh, defeated uh, uh, the army of uh, Hood. A very spectacular effort. You have at Gettysburg, you have the uh, 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 Battle of Chickamauga, and you have Little Rock. And so I said to the committee, let's take the governor's letter as a suggestion, not a mandate. He is suggesting that everything is open for discussion. So it's open to discussion while we do these pictures. And then I went down to the adjutant general, who I knew, and he told me, he says, you know, I'll just bring the new National Guard troops up to the governor's reception room. I talk about the history of the Minnesota regiments. And I said, okay, I want you to write a letter, and I want you to come to the art committee and tell you what this art in the reception room means to you and how you use it. He did. Game, set, match. It's over. They're still in the... Uh, governor's reception room. But there, Jan, I need your help here now. Not this one. This is uh, not a terribly good picture. But if you would hand out these two things. One is the picture of the Capitol, and the other is a better picture of the Treaty of Travis de Sioux. I didn't bring enough. I thought this was going to be a smaller crowd. I apologize. I mean, I didn't realize you'd come out to hear my somewhat dated presentation. But anyway, this picture used to be behind where the governor made his announcements at press conference. It was behind me when he announced my appointment to the Court of Appeals. And I referred to it very proudly. I said, my ancestors came to Minnesota in 1855 because of this treaty. The land was opened for settlement, and this is where people went. It was very offensive to Native Americans. They were robbed. Six cents an acre, uh, three cents of which went, you see there's, oh, you get the thing around, there's a whiskey barrel off to the side. That's where the whiskey barrel treaty, there were three treaties, one for the Native Americans, one for the government, and one for the traders. And the whiskey barrel treaty gave the traders, am I not, I'm getting a signal. Oh, is that what you mean? Oh, that's the signal you want. Not this. <laughs> this, this is the signal you want. Okay. Anyway, uh, it was very offensive. I referred to it with pride, but uh, ultimately came to realize it didn't belong there. This is an interesting picture. Father Hennepin discovering the falls of St. Anthony. Uh-oh. No, we have to relabel that. Native Americans knew it was there for 10,000 years. So it's at the Falls of St. Anthony. But this is a not an accurate picture for a number of reasons. At the time, there was an island out there in the middle. It was a sacred island to the Native Americans. And that's what the women would go to give birth and whatever. But this picture was there because of on Ireland, he wanted some religious symbolism. But you couldn't have this heathen icon, island, in the picture. So it's gone. Now, if you... Uh, Father Hennepin was a legitimate hero. He really did some good things. And he did write about, on occasion, the Native Americans were... women were not clothed 
from the waist up. I have a closer uh, picture of the Native American woman, but my wife said, Jan said, Paul, this is church. <laughs> you, 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 you can't show it. I said, well, okay, you, it, it's good enough there. And so uh, Father Hampton didn't write about the way women dress, but not normally. Think about mosquitoes and cold, okay? <laughs> That's not the way they dress. And so we were going to take this picture out of the uh, governor's reception room. The Catholic Church went ballistic, and they wanted to come and meet with the, I was co-chair of the Art and the Capital Committee, to meet with us, so they met with us. And Jason Atkins, a really nice guy, said, you can't take it out. It belongs there, his historic. And if the picture of the Native American woman is offensive, just paint over it. You can just paint over it. I heard him say that, let that statement hang out there for about 45 seconds, and said, Jason, am I hearing you right? You are proposing that the Catholic Church and the state government of Minnesota participate in a cover-up? <laughs> uh, are you sure, or you think that the state would be willing to, you know, engage in a cover-up? Uh, I mean, if you want to come with that to the governor and the legislature, you're welcome to, but, you know, it's going to be described and viewed as that. Game, set, match is over. Here's some of the restored art. This is Socrates uh, lecturing to one of his students. This is some more restored art. See, the problem in the, this is in the Capitol courtroom. Think about a bunch of old, middle-aged, older lawyers smoking cigars as they're making an argument to the Supreme Court, and that smoke wafting towards the ceiling, and it has to settle someplace. It settled on these pictures. They were pretty dull and uninteresting. This is a point of pride for me. Take a look at these two pictures. See, these, these are the doors that go out to the balcony. And the original, you see this lip there? They had this lip that you know, made that balcony pretty inaccessible. Now, the Historical Society, in its kind of prototype remodeling, remodeled a couple of these doors with this lip. And I said, wait a second. When I leave the court and I want to address the gathering, adoring throngs, I want people to be able to get out to the balcony. And they said, if somebody's in a wheelchair, they can't get out there. What if my mother wanted to go out there? She couldn't get out there. It took eight months of lobbying and work to get it restored to this. And one of my most proud moments during the restoration ceremony was when I was walking by here and I saw uh, a young man in a wheelchair and this area was open for viewing. He was in that wheelchair and just shoo, right out on the balcony. I said, you know, this is the way it should be. I gotta hurry up now because it's changed from this to this. <laughs> uh, we designed new space for the press. This is the press conference room so that they can go here for press conferences. Ah, these two pictures go together. This is Warren Berger. That is Harry Blackman. Wait, that's Warren Berger, yeah, that's him. Doesn't look like Blackman. They were gonna put the Minnesota Twins in the alcoves on the entrance to the Supreme Court chamber, but Harry Blackman wrote Roe versus Wade. They went ballistic the thought that Harry Blackman would have his bust in the Capitol. So heated is that that's where it was supposed to be, now the uh, monitoring device. So there's Blackman, but, no, there's Berger, but there's not Blackman. I think Berger was a better justice. And this is my last one. We are getting more women into the Capitol. This is one of the most recent additions. This is, uh, Nellie Stone Johnson, an iconic figure in civil rights in the state of Minnesota. She was to the forefront of trying to get equal rights. And now her statue is in the Capitol. She is one of uh, more women getting in the Capitol. And I better, oh, by the way, here's, here's some marble. I, oh, I got another story. When uh, 
Did any of you ever read George Suchery in the St. Paul paper? He's a curmudgeon, a bit of a grouch, and he likes to complain about things. And so he wrote an article complaining about, you know, what's going to happen to the marble that's, you know, taken off the Capitol and saying that we don't are insensitive. Uh, the day before the grand opening of the Capitol, Ted Lentz and I spent to have three hours in his garage breaking up marble so that when people came to the opening and if they wanted to take a piece of marble with them, it was given to them for free. So there are a lot of pieces of marble that serve as paperweights in the back of garages and closets, but there are a number of people in the state of Minnesota have a piece of Georgian marble from the restored capital. Okay, questions? Pick it up on the. Actually, I'm a teacher. I don't need a microphone. <laughs> I would like to compliment you. Years ago, when we had the bash, I bid on a tour of the Capitol, and you took several of us there. It was the most fabulous field trip as a teacher that I have ever been on. So thank you, thank you. Jan? Uh, by the way, Cass Gilbert saw this as the people's building. And he knew in the turn of the 19th century we were a state of immigrants. And so he put a lot of uh, quotes up on the wall that basically told about what our American civil democracy is about. I'll set them on the chair. Jan, you can set them on the chair over. You can pick them up afterwards. But this building is to basically say who we are as a country. You're welcome to take one. I, I, I underestimated the crowd. This is, you, were, you were supposed to be less than half the size. By the way, if you work at it and treat me nicely, I might do it again. <laughs> I am Susan? not as spry as I used to be. I do not have the bounce in my step that I used to have, but I still love giving a tour. Thank you for all your work in the restoration the January, by the way. and fighting a bunch of the battles that needed to get done on the artwork because that's near and dear. <clears throat> um, they used to, after the restoration was done, have a sunset tour. You could buy tickets to go up to the Quadrica. That's been off You don't again. need a ticket. Well, they, they suspended it during COVID. Is it I? Yeah, no, you can go up there now. Oh, you can. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's part of the uh, <clears throat> regular tour. I used to be able to go up there myself, but they've restricted that now. On. So I, when I give tours, I tack on to a regular tour that goes up there, or if I have a, a larger tour. I, I really pander to the docents at the Capitol. <laughs> I mean, when I need to, I can pander. And because of that, they treat me well. And so uh, they often will let me take groups up to the country. 135 steps, getting harder for me as I get older. Anyway, other questions? That's it, huh? I Thank will, you. Maybe I will. I, I urge you to visit the Capitol. It is truly one of the uh, architectural wonders in the United States. And it's right here, close at hand in Minnesota. And uh, go there and celebrate our civil democracy. Thank you.